Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Harry Brown, and I'm so glad to be back with you this evening, February 14th, 2004, for another two hours of a look at the world around us, society, politics, government, the whole works. I will be approaching it from a libertarian standpoint, which means that I don't want the government involved in anything. I don't want the government taking your money and spending it on other things. I don't want the government intruding on your life and telling you how to live your life. I don't want the government telling you how you must raise your children. I don't want the government locking you up as a material witness in some terrorist investigation. I want the government playing out of your life. Well, tonight we're going to begin with a pop quiz. Ah, you weren't ready for that, were you? Grab yourself a pencil and a piece of paper, because I'm going to ask you five questions about American wars. And this will give you a chance to test your knowledge, to see how conversant you are with the history of American wars. And then we will go on from there, and at the bottom of the hour, I'll give you the answers to the questions. Question number one. What American war began because of an apparent attack on the United States that later turned out to be quite different from what we were told during the war? That's question number one. Question number two, what American war provoked a large anti-war protest movement that caused the U.S. government to violate civil liberties, disrupt the anti-war protesters, and jail people for their anti-war views? Number three, in what American war did our government make rosy promises of a much better world, a much more peaceful world that would follow the end of the war? Promises that unfortunately did not come true. Question four, in what American war did the U.S. government ally itself with brutal regimes, calling those allies uh, freedom fighters, uh, democracies, and other complementary epithets that, of course, were grossly untrue? And finally, question number five. In what American war was the Bill of Rights abandoned and people sent to prison without regard for due process of the law of any kind whatsoever? That's question five. All right. You got your answers? Good. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. I just want you to mull on those a little bit before we go over the answers. We already have an email from Jerry out there in cyberspace, and he says, A friend of mine said he's going to vote for Kerry since he can't stand Bush anymore. The same friend in 2000 said he voted for Bush because he couldn't stand Al Gore anymore. And Jerry goes on to say, At least he's not wasting his votes. He didn't waste it on George Bush, that's for sure. Uh, nice comment. Uh, Jerry also says, that Bill O'Reilly said that Bush and Kerry are polar opposites. I then read through both Kerry's and Bush's issues on their websites and found nothing they disagreed on, other than that Kerry thinks Bush did the Iraqi war all wrong. Well, that's a very interesting point. O'Reilly says that Bush and Kerry are polar opposites. I've seen that as well. I've seen people, mostly conservatives, saying this is going to be a real issue race because the, you couldn't have two people who are more opposite than Bush and Kerry. And you know why they're saying that? Because they want you to be scared to death of John Kerry. That if Kerry gets elected, he's going to overturn our whole way of life. He's going to reject the Constitution. He's going to do all these things. Well, of course, he's not going to do anything that George Bush isn't doing already. He's going to want to spend more money on education, just like George Bush. He's going to want to spend more money on health care, just like George Bush. He's going to want to have new welfare initiatives, just like George Bush. And no matter what he says about the Iraqi war, you can be sure that American foreign policy is not going to change under John Kerry. He's not going to bring the troops home. He's not going to cut off foreign aid to foreign dictators. He's not going to do anything that George Bush isn't doing already. The same thing is going on on the liberal side to a certain extent. Over the past year, I've heard a lot of liberals say, George Bush is trying to repeal the New Deal, that that's what Bush's object is. So he's trying to repeal the New Deal. And again, the liberals are trying to scare their brethren into thinking that we are going to go back to a laissez-faire economy, that we are going to go back to the days before the income tax, the Federal Reserve System, uh, farm subsidies, welfare at the federal level, federal aid to education, federal health care, and so forth. When, of course, George Bush is trying no such thing. George Bush is doing all the same things Roosevelt did in the 1930s, floating all kinds of initiatives, floating all kinds of proposals, and they're all in the direction of making government bigger. Politicians simply do not propose programs that are going to make government smaller. And it doesn't matter whether they're talking about privatizing Social Security or school choice or faith-based initiatives or whatever it is, it's still going to make government larger. It's going to add new regulations that people are going to have to follow in order to get federal money. It's all in one direction. And it doesn't matter whether it's George Bush, John Kerry, Bill Clinton, Al Gore, Howard Dean, Dennis Kucinich, it doesn't really matter because they are all pointed in the same direction. They are all politicians and they are all there to increase the power of government. Not because they love government, but because they love themselves. And they love the power. 
that increased government gives them. They love the opportunity to play God with foreign countries. They love the opportunity to shove people around from here to there like pawns on a chessboard. They love the idea that they are going to go down in history as a great president. And if you look at all the lists of the great presidents, they are ones who led America in war or who completely revolutionized American life as Roosevelt did. Whatever it may be, it's always in the direction of more government. And that's what these people want. So it really doesn't matter who gets elected this year. It's going to be more of the same. Well, let's see what's going on out in the real world. Let's talk first tonight with Bart in Cleveland. Good evening, Bart. Hello, Harry. Hi there. How are you doing? I'm just fine. What's on your mind tonight? See, this last week, I think it was, uh, you were talking to somebody about the feds, uh-huh. and, and you had said that we're still kind of paying a price for for the policies of the fed. And I was wondering, uh, are you talking about the Federal Reserve System? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I just wondered how you'd answer a person that would uh, would bring up the, uh, the so-called incredible uh, amount of, of growth that, that we had in the 90s. During the Clinton administration. Well, it's a funny thing about that incredible amount of growth. The tremendous growth that we had during the Clinton administration was less than the average yearly growth between 1945 and 1973. It's funny. For 28 years, the economy grew at an average rate of 4%, even allowing for the recessions that occurred during those 28 years, and there were several of them. And yet, from that point on, the average growth was cut in half and down to about 2%, so that when Clinton was able to show average growth of about 3%, everybody said, oh, isn't that wonderful? The same thing happened in the 80s with Reagan. Uh, boy, those were the great prosperous Reagan years, uh, Reaganomics, look what it did for the economy. But the Reagan years were no better than the Clinton years, and both of them were subpar compared to just average years uh, prior to 1973. Now, what happened in 1973? It was nothing that happened that year. It was that the last straw got on the camel's back at that point. We had had during the 60s the Great Society followed by Nixon's Great Society. We had wage and price controls, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, the EP. All uh, the OSHA was uh, set up, the Civil Rights Acts, all of these different things piled one more thing on top of the economy, one more thing and one more thing and one more thing, and finally it reached the point where it was too much for the economy. So today we celebrate as a great achievement something that we would have considered to be subpar back in the 1950s or the 1960s. Stay with us, Bart. We're going to take a brief break, and then we'll be right back. This is Harry Brown. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and we're talking with Bart in Cleveland. And Bart asked about the economy in the 90s, which he said seemed to do very well in spite of what I had said a week or two ago about the Federal Reserve really gumming up the economy with its manipulation of the money supply. Are you still with us, Bart? Bart? Yes, I'm still here. D- did what I say make sense? Well, it's not the first time that I've heard that, but what is uh, kind of frustrating is if, if you turn on the TV, you'll consistently hear reporters probably saying that it's the longest period of growth we've ever had in the history of the country. Well, it may be. I haven't really tried to figure that out, but if it's the longest period of growth, it was very slow growth during that time. It's just that it was unbroken by a recession, but it doesn't mean that it was really uh, something that we would have cheered uh, 40 years ago. So you, you just cannot have a $2 trillion government. You can't have regulators sticking their nose in everybody's business and telling companies how to run their affairs uh, to please the government instead of please their customers and please their employees and expect to have the kind of growth that we really would like to have in this country. It just can't happen. Yeah, we're going to be like a Soviet Union, I guess. I guess so. All right. Thanks so much for calling, Bart. It's good to hear from you. Check in any old time. Let's go now to New Orleans and talk with Jeffrey. Good evening, Jeffrey. Hi. I'm going to answer those five questions you gave. All right. Before you do, though, for the benefit of our listeners, Jeffrey is a libertarian. His last name is Dykett, and he's running for the libertarian nomination for president. And I just wanted to ask you how your campaign is going. Uh, what have you been doing to try to get the nomination? Well, I went up to Kansas City uh, on January uh, 31st and uh, February the 1st and spoke at the 14th Ward Assembly up in, um, 30, up in the library in Kansas City, and I will be speaking in Atlanta on the 27th and 28th at the Georgia Libertarian Convention and Rally. And I will also be probably speaking at Arkansas at the end of March, and then who knows what's going to happen. Sure. Uh, but you'll be at the convention, in, uh, the national convention I don't in May. Know. Okay, good. Well, good luck to you, Jeffrey. All right, you wanted to answer the five questions that I posed. Right. Okay, what American war began because of an apparent attack on the United States that later turned out to be quite different from what we had been told during the war? Well, an apparent attack on the U.S. is, is probably um, the uh, Spanish-American War, but, that, but it could also have been World War II. Okay, the sinking of the Maine in the Spanish-American War and Pearl Harbor in World right. War II. Okay, what American war provoked a large anti-war protest movement that caused the U.S. government to violate civil liberties, disrupt the protesters, and jail people for their anti-war views? Well, the first one was World War One, and then possibly in Vietnam that same thing happened, but World War One was more prominent, was just as prominent. Okay, in what American war did our government make rosy promises of a much better world, a peaceful world that was going to follow the end of the war, and the promises failed to come true? World War One. 
No doubt about it. That's Wilson's 14 points. Okay. Number four, in what American war did the U.S. government ally itself with brutal regimes and calling those allies freedom fighters, democracies, and other kinds of complementary labels that, of course, were untrue? Well, the closest one that I can think of to that is possibly the present war on terrorism. That's the most prominent one where we're allied with the communists openly, but we've also been allied with the communists after World War I and after World War II. Okay. And then in what American war was the Bill of Rights abandoned and people sent to prison without regard for any due process of law? That's the war for Southern independence or the war of Northern aggression or the war between the states. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus, invoked Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1 of the Constitution, and imprisoned most people who were Southern sympathizers or were members of the Copperheads. That is, people who wanted to see uh, the federal government reduced in size and have the state governments take more control. All right. Well, uh, good work, Jeffrey. You know your history pretty well. Why don't you hang up now, and I will give my answers to these questions. I appreciate your call, and again, good luck to you in your campaign. All right, we've got about a minute before the break, and then we'll have a long segment to follow. So let me go ahead and get started with the answers to this quiz. What American war began because of an apparent attack on the United States that later turned out to be quite different from what we had been told during the war? Well, as Jeffrey pointed out, the Civil War was that case, or the War for Southern Independence. When the Southerners fired on Fort Sumter, it was considered or announced as unprovoked by Abraham Lincoln that all the northern ships were trying to do was to just provide provisions to that fort, but as a matter of fact, it turned out that the northern ships were loaded with munitions, and it was quite different from the way it had been billed by the federal government. In the Spanish-American War, as Je Jeffrey pointed out, the sinking of the Maine turned out years later, after a thorough investigation, to have been a boiler that exploded and not a mine in the harbor, but it was an excuse for the United States to go to war. In World War I, we had the sinking of the Lusitania, and even though that happened two years before America declared war on Germany, it was cited over and over and over again, but the Lusitania was carrying munitions to the British. We'll come back to this when we return. We're going to take a brief break. This is Harry Brown. Stay with me. You'll be surprised at some of these answers. I mentioned World War I. Uh, this was the question of the apparent attack on the United States that turned out to be quite different from what we had been told during the war. And the Lusitania uh, was not an unprovoked attack on a cruise ship. It was loaded with munitions. The German government ran ads in the New York newspapers saying that anybody who went on that ship was doing so at their own risk because it was going to sail into a war zone and the Germans were not going to respect it and they gave fair warning. World War II, of course, was Pearl Harbor and it turned out afterward that Roosevelt had been browbeating the Japanese, trying to get them to attack so that Roosevelt could get into the European war. And in recent years, it's become apparent that not only did Americans break the Japanese diplomatic code so that they knew that the Japanese were planning something, but they also broke the military code so they really probably knew that the attack was going to be at Pearl Harbor. And then, of course, in Vietnam, we had the Gulf of Tonkin, supposed attack on American boats, which were in places where they shouldn't have been to begin with, but there really was no attack, it turned out later, but this attack was used to get the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution passed, which escalated U.S. involvement in the war. Number two, what American war provoked a large anti-war protest movement that caused the U.S. government to violate civil liberties, disrupt protesters, and jail people for their views? Well, that happened in spades during the Civil War. It happened in spades during World War One. It happened less intensely during World War II. It happened quite intensely during the Vietnam War, and it's happening today in the War on Terror. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the federal government, ordered the Drake University to turn over the names of all the anti-war protesters who had shown up at a rally there to protest the war. Number three, in what American war did our government make rosy promises of a much better world that would follow the end of the war? Well, World War One, as Jeffrey pointed out with Wilson's 14 points, none of which came to pass. World War Two, in which Roosevelt talked about the four freedoms and the United Nations was going to prevent future wars. Of course, that didn't happen. The Korean War, Truman said that if America took a stand in Korea, then the communists would not try to take any more territory around the world. And of course, as soon as the Korean War was over, the Vietnam war started and then the vietnam war in reverse where the united states said that if the united states didn't fight in vietnam the dominoes would fall well the united states fought in vietnam and the dominoes fell anyway during the gulf war george bush senior promised the new world order and now george bush jr is promising an end to all evildoers in the world and it just goes on and on and on it's what the historian Charles Beard called the perpetual war for perpetual peace. We're always at war, and it's always to bring about a perpetual peace that will be undisturbed, and of course it never comes. Number four, in what American war did the U.S. government ally itself with brutal regimes, calling those allies freedom fighters, democracies, and other complementary terms? Well, in World War I, Wilson said we were doing this to bring self-determination to all the peoples of the world, but he was allying himself with the British, who were repressing people in Ireland and India and Egypt, uh, brutally repressing them and not allowing them self-determination at all, in World War II, we were allied with the Soviet Union and building them up, giving them resources to make it possible to start the Cold War afterward. During the Korean War, 
They talked about Sigmund Rhee and the South Koreans as being freedom fighters when, in fact, it was a very repressive regime. People were shot just simply because some neighbor called them a communist. In the Vietnam War was the same thing, brutal re regimes in South Vietnam that were just as bad as the ones in North Vietnam. We shouldn't have been involved on either side. In the Gulf War, of course, we were allied with the Russians and the Chinese, and even the Syrians got into the act on the side of the Great Coalition for Peace. And now in the War on Terror, here we are making whoopee with Pakistan, uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and all these other countries that George Bush calls our partners in the coalition against terror. So it just goes on and on and on. We build up these countries in one war and then go to war with them in the next war. Number five, in what American war was the Bill of Rights abandoned and people sent to prison without regard for due process of the law? Well, of course, in the Civil War, it was just unbelievable. Abraham Lincoln closed down state legislatures. If they didn't do what he wanted, he even issued a warrant for the arrest of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court because of a decision the court made that displeased Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it goes on and on and on. In World War One, people went to prison for 10 or 20 years for protesting the draft or the war itself. In World War Two, the Japanese were interned without any due process of law, without any investigation to see if these people were pro-Japanese spies or whatever. And now it's happening in the war on terror as people are being held without trial, people are being held without even access to an attorney and so forth. Now, what's the point of this quiz? What's the point of all of it? It is that nothing ever changes. It is the same thing war after war after war. But along with the fact that it's the same thing war after war after war, the politicians keep trying to make us believe that this situation is different. This time it's all different. This time the threat is greater than it ever was before. This time if we accomplish this, if we get victory, we're going to have peace forever. But it's just the same old propaganda that has been going on for years and years and years. And when I say years and years, I really mean centuries. And probably the greatest lie that you can possibly imagine is that when George Bush said 9-11 changed everything, he was either showing a total disregard or an, an ignorance of history, or he was simply lying through his teeth, because 9-11 didn't change a single thing. America had been attacked by terrorists before. America had attacked foreign countries before. The World Trade Center was bombed back in 1993, in case you've forgotten. A dozen people died and a thousand people were injured in that attack, and somebody went to prison for many, many years as a result of that terrorist attack. The Marines were attacked in Lebanon, and dozens and dozens of them were killed. The Achille Laurel was hijacked, and Mr. Klinghoffer was thrown over the side. The Pan American plane was downed over Lockerbie, Scotland, and it goes on and on and on. There have been terrorist attacks before. No, they didn't result in 3,000 people dying, but a World Trade Center attack of 2001 is simply a difference in degree, not a difference in kind. And the United States has done exactly what it's doing now in attacking Afghanistan and Iraq. It is no different from the invasion of Grenada, the invasion of Panama, the invasion of Iraq back in 1991. It's just been going on over and over and over again. Nothing has changed, and that's what we have to realize is that this just goes on in a revolving door over and over and over and over and over again. We go round and round in this circle, and nothing ever changes. It is time to break the cycle. It is time to realize that we don't bring peace to the world by going over seas and killing people, that by bombing innocent people, all we do is create the enemies for the next war. And it has been done over and over and over again. What should be done? We should bring our troops home. What should be done? We should ch stop propping up dictators with our foreign aid because that creates tremendous anti-American feeling around the world. What should be done? We should quit telling other countries what they must do. We should quit demanding that a country change its leaders or that it change its policies. We should retreat to these shores and worry about the United States, have free trade with everybody in the world that wants to trade with us, allow free people to go into the country, out of the country, whatever, but don't mess with people overseas. And if you think that's not good enough, then just realize this, that our government has $2 trillion a year at its disposal. With that $2 trillion, it could certainly hire the best minds in the world to come up with a better solution than using these caveman tactics of going around and beating people to death. Well, I'm happy to say that I got two emails uh, shortly after I gave the quiz questions at the beginning of the show. Danny says, I think that pretty much any war that America has been involved in could be the answer to any of your questions. Perhaps a better question would be, which American war would not be a valid answer to all five of your previous questions? Very good, Danny. And Jim sent a brief email saying all of them, every single one, every single war was an example of what I had stated. But it has been the perpetual war for a perpetual peace. And it's starting the next phase. Jeff Jacoby, who sometimes calls himself a libertarian, but he's really a conservative columnist for the Boston Globe. And on February 9th, he talked about the fact that after the Holocaust, people said never again. After the ethnic cleansing in Bosnia and Kosovo, people said never again. And it just goes on like that. And he says, which brings us to North Korea. It's not exactly news that the communist regime of Kim Jong II has sent million. pardon me, that's not the second, Kim Jong-il has sent millions of North Koreans to early graves. 
Estimates are that as many as 800,000 people were dying in North Korea each year from starvation and malnutrition caused by Kim's ruthless and irrational policies. And he goes on to talk about the gulag in North Korea and all these terrible atrocities that are going on and then says, and of course it is widely known that Kim is openly pursuing nuclear weapons, has fired missiles capable of reaching Japan, and controls one of the largest military forces on Earth. Yeah, I guess it's so large that it's as big as 10% of the American military force. And he goes on to say all of this is hideous enough and more than sufficient reason for making Kim's ouster and his prosecution for crimes against humanity an explicit goal of the United States. But now comes something new. And he goes on to talk about some new program by which they are now using human beings as guinea pigs for biochemical weapons. Jacoby winds up saying gas chambers, poison food, torture, families murdered on mosques, staggering death tolls. How much more do we need to know about North Korea's crimes before we act to stop them? How many more victims must be fed into the gas chambers before we cry out, never again? and mean it. In other words, hey, let's go to a war again. Now that the Iraqi war is done, let's go to North Korea and fight there. And after North Korea, it'll be Syria and then Iran and Libya, and, and we can just go on all around the world. And some of those great coalition partners that we have now, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, I mean, those countries are brutal dictatorships. So we've got them waiting in the wings whenever we run out of avowed explicit enemies. It just never stops. And if you think you're going to rid the world of evil, then I've got to say, why don't you start in Washington, D.C., that has one of the worst crime rates in the world? And if you can't clean up the streets in Washington, D.C., if you can't end crime and murder in Washington, D.C., then what makes you think you can bring peace to Iraq or North Korea or any place else in the world? Well, let me hear what you think. This is Harry Brown. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Welcome back. Harry Brown here. Let's go back to the phones immediately. Let's talk first with David in Florida. Good evening, David. Hello, Harry Brown, one of my favorite libertarian folks. Well, thank you. Harry, I, got a, I, I want to just respond to the point you made that how do the, how, how does the government, in this case Bush, how are they going to clean up the rest of the world when they can't clean up the, the high crime rate in Washington, D.C.? And I've only been in Washington, D.C. a few times, and it's not one of my favorite places because I feel very unsafe there. And the reason I feel unsafe, but it's not, it's not partic- what politically correct to say it, is because who, let's look at who commits the crime. Who are the criminals? Most of them are products of government criminal breeding welfare programs, you know, where, the, where their mothers were paid for having, being unmarried and having babies. They have this extremely tough gun control laws where only criminals can have firearms. You have the drug prohibition where so much of the crime is based on you know, the government price support system for drug dealers. They're doing it because either to pay for their artificially inflated prices of the drugs or because they're dealers themselves and you get caught in a crossfire just like you did during alcohol prohibition. Well, it's a, a model government city then. <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying. So, I mean, that, that, and that's exactly what the Democrats and the Republicans have wanted. They've bred generations of fatherless criminals. They've bred uh, all the things that you you know, libertarians believe in that we oppose so vehemently. They're doing it and perpetuating it. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, of course, if it doesn't work in Washington, D.C., why is it going to work in Iraq? Because all we're doing is trying to export the, the very kinds of government, big government programs of America over to these foreign countries when we conquer them and try to uh, create a new democracy there. Of course, it's not a democracy in the sense that people are free to make their own choices. Rather, it is a, an imposed from the top system that the United States wants to uh, install in those countries. Well, so, I, I recently, with my wife and daughter, we were in the Caribbean on a vacation for a, a few days, and it's fascinating because there was an article in one of the newspapers saying that the importation of American welfare programs have destroyed the society in those countries. They said because now everything's welfare based. They have the same drug prohibition laws. They have the same giveaways to it's destroy the family. This, these are uh, the Caribbean islands. Oh, you're Caribbean, talking? I forget exactly. Yeah, like Jamaica and Bermuda Jamaica and the Bahamas. And Bermuda. I've never been to Bermuda, but Jamaica, uh, the French one, but they have the Martinique and all those little ones. Mm-hmm. But they said the whole Caribbean islands they're basically becoming like American welfare type system. That is, welfare has destroyed. You know, the criminal breeding welfare programs have destroyed the American family and they've destroyed the caribbean family they don't have daddies anymore daddy's a welfare chick yeah well that's a good point it's sad it's tragic i mean there again when you get off a boat in jamaica a big sign drugs are illegal but they are underneath they should probably have available only through a uh, police <laughs> only through the police or your neighborhood oh, your uh, neighborhood uh, the drug dealer <laughs> a government supported drug dealer yeah, yeah right it's tragic it's horrible <laughs> yeah it is i you shouldn't can't, you can't legally carry guns there only criminals can carry them Right. Well, uh, we're exporting democracy around the world, and uh, the whole world looks to us. They don't look to the Statue of Liberty anymore. They look to the Statue of Limitations. I'd like to see the Statue of Libertarianism. Keep up the good fight, Harry. Thanks so much for calling, David. I appreciate it. All right, uh, Richard in Tennessee, let's get started before we have to break for the news. What's on your mind tonight? Well, I don't know how to follow up a, a racist act like that. <laughs> Why do you think it's racist? Uh, uh, do you well, think well, all people on welfare are black or something? Well, who, who else was he talking about? He wasn't talking about corporate welfare. He wasn't talking about uh, 
Are farmers being paid not to plant crops and oh, being paid I, subsidies as welfare? Well, I'm I mean, sure if uh, down Richard, I'm sure that if that if that had been germane to Washington D.C., he would have mentioned them because no, he's he said, uh, yes, he would. He's talking, he's, about, he's talking about welfare. That's no, wait a second. Wait a second, Richard. You're confusing David and Florida with the Republicans, and I understand I'm, I'm your concern. I'm talking about conservatives. I'm not talking about Republicans. And libertarians are as conservative as Republicans, as some Democrats, as a Reform Party candidates. All these other people are all just members of the same club. No, I don't think so. Uh, libertarians do not like corporate welfare. They do not like farm subsidies. They don't want the government involved in anything. And that's what differs them from conservatives and from liberals. And, Richard, I want to hear more of what you have to say, so I hope you don't mind just hanging on the phone while we go to the news break. And I'll give you all the time you want when we come back. This is Harry Brown. Please stay with me because we got another hour to go on this show. We'll be right back. Right now, we're talking with Richard in Tennessee. And, Richard, I appreciate your hanging on the line through that long news break, during which you got to hear how George Bush is going to do more nice things for us <laughs> in, in the next months and years, if he gets the chance. He might. So, uh, so Richard, you feel that people who focus, uh, who say anything bad about welfare are racist? Is that what you, is, did, is, did I understand you correctly? Conservatives, yeah. I mean, that's been uh, their, their consistent message uh, over the course of my life. And I'm a middle-aged man now. And I've been hearing this ever since I was a kid. So what's new? Well, do you think the federal government should be involved in charity in any way whatsoever? Oh, you mean charity like in the form of uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution? So well, they're not that, about – they're not about – They're not about uh, – decisions, all of that? So that? None of that has anything to do with charity. I'm talking about taking money from people and giving it to other people on the basis that those other people are more needy. Do you think that's the role that government should be playing is to redistribute the wealth, to take it from some people and give it to others? Well, we, we do live in a representative democracy, so that's part of it. Well, we also have a constitution which is supposed to spell out what government is allowed to do and not do. If you hire an agent to represent you in the sale of books that you write or music that you write or something of that sort, and you find out that that agent is now refinancing your house for you or sending your kids to a different school, you'd be a little upset because that's not what you hired the agent for. And our government was set up to perform certain functions as outlined in the Constitution, and now we find that there isn't anything that the government doesn't think that it is entitled to stick its nose into. Well, that's that's mostly or, or partly our fault since they do work for us. And when we don't crack the whip on them, well, they figure they've got free reign and they, they've got a free hand to do what they want to do. When was the last time that you went to Washington? and knocked on a congressman's door and or cornered somebody in the in the hallway and buttonholed him and told him what you want i didn't have to do that uh, usually uh the representatives are, are coming down here and they, they make their rounds and, and that's the best way to catch up with them how frequently does that happen and how often do you get to talk to a congressman uh let's see i come down I, I don't know uh i don't know if it's on a monthly basis or, or not but uh, something like that but that, uh, wasn't, that wasn't why I called in. I mean, well, let me just finish that point, and then you can go ahead with what you did call in about. But I want you to know that every single day of the year that a congressman is in Washington, he is accosted by a lobbyist, by a representative of special interests. And by special interests, I mean people who want corporate welfare, union representatives who want special laws for labor unions, issue-oriented people who want more welfare, who want more affirmative action, who want more rules against abortion, who whatever it may be. And these people are pounding on these congressmen day after day after day, and it is no surprise that they may come and listen to you when once a month, but pay no attention to you whatsoever because it's the guys in Washington who are buttonholing them in the hallways and who are showing up in their offices daily who really have the clout, who have the ability to say, I can get votes for you, I can get money for you, I can do all these other things, and this is what I want. Well, and so just because the government does something doesn't mean that we, the people, ask for it. It means that a certain group of people within a very small subset of the American population has for these things, and the next thing you know, we have a $2 trillion government. We're sending $2 trillion to Washington, and we ain't getting $2 trillion worth of benefits back. Well, the fact is, uh, I was just wanting to ask you just exactly what would you do? How would you pare down the government if you were miracle of miracles <laughs> in a position to uh, <laughs> to make such moves? I, w I would uh, offer a budget if I were president of the United States, and the budget needs to be no more than $100 billion a year, which is 5%, less than 5% of what the budget is now. That budget would be sufficient for a national defense, which the Constitution provides for, although the Constitution does not provide for a national offense, which is what we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars on now. It also would provide for the other functions that are listed in the Constitution as legitimate functions of the government. But it would mean an end to federal welfare, federal education, federal health care, federal foreign aid, federal farm subsidies, federal corporate welfare. It would mean an end to all of these areas that the federal government has gotten into, including regulation of business, uh, regulation of individuals, regulation of, of the airwaves, and all of the other things that the federal government has taken on without constitutional authority. Well, what, what, what departments would you eliminate? 
I don't know that I could even remember them all, but the Department of Energy, the Department of Health and Human Services, isn't there a highway department, is the Transportation the Department? Department of Safety. Uh, uh, yes, the OSHA. I mean, all these agencies, the EPA and so forth, the federal government has no business in any of them. All we really need is a Department of Defense. I'm not sure we need a Department of State. The only reason for having a State Department is to go around the world and make deals with other countries, and I would like to see an end to that. We need a, uh, do we need a National Security Advisor, a National Security Council? Uh, I don't really think so, no. That should be a function of the Department of Defense. Uh-huh. And it should be a Department of Defense, not a Department of Offense. Well, uh, that's exactly what you, what would you do about Congress then? Would you, uh, would you try to cut uh, the kind of uh, money that they get to do their jobs? And, and also, would you take a, a big pay cut? as president, if you were president? Well, I don't see why the president of the United States should get $200,000 a year. I really haven't given any thought to that, so I, I can't name a figure, but uh, 200000 uh-huh. 200, seems like a lot. Certainly the congressmen are grossly overpaid. They should not be there all year round. They should be there for about one month uh, a, per year at the most, and for that they need to get maybe, what, $10,000 plus uh, uh, travel expenses. That's about all they need. Uh, you know, and I've told this story before, so excuse me if you've heard it before, but in, in California, back in the 1960s, the state legislature used to meet every other year for a couple of months. And every legislator, whether a state senator or an assemblyman, was a part-time legislator. And somebody got the bright idea that if they paid the legislators more, they would get better people in the legislature. And so instead of whatever paltry sum they were getting, they started getting a sum that was equal to a full-time job. And guess what? It became a full-time job, and the legislators are there all year round, every year, instead of just spending a couple of months every other year. The result is that the budget for the state of California has gone from less than $1 billion to what is now, I believe, around $80 billion a year uh, as a result of having legislators there all year round, doing their mischief, passing bills, get rewarding friends, punishing enemies, and so on. And that's exactly what's happened in Congress. Uh, 100, 150 years ago, the congressmen didn't spend all year round in Washington, D.C. Well, uh, what would you say to uh, the point... Uh, uh changing the, the way that appointed positions uh, are occupied. In other words, shouldn't there be term limits, term limits on them? That's what I think, that no one should sit on the Supreme Court for the rest of their lives or, or any of the federal benches that uh, they should only be there for a select few years. Uh, the FCC and all these other places, uh, other positions also should have uh, term limits on them. Well, I think in general it's a good idea. We have to realize that with the regulatory agencies, I don't want the regulatory agencies to even exist, but if they're going to exist, term limits could be uh, producing exactly the opposite of what you want, and that is if somebody's limited to five years uh, uh, with the FCC or the SEC or the FTC, then the possibility that he is going to be rewarded once he gets out of that job with a really plum job in the industry that he's supposed to be regulating uh, goes up considerably. Yeah, but, but you tighten him up through... Uh, through con- congressional legislation. It's their job, anyway, to monitor these, these regulatory agencies. And they do a wonderful job of it, don't they? <laughs> yeah, you mean, uh, <laughs> you mean facetious, right? <laughs> How did you guess? <laughs> well, I, I just want to know what, what, what you wanted to. What right. you I, I want to get rid of those agencies. They have no business being there. All There are only two laws that need to be enforced in any society. Number one, do all that you have promised to do. Do not commit fraud. Do not agree to do something and then renege on it. Do not sign a contract and then not abide by it. Number two, do not intrude on anyone else's person or property without his permission. And if those were the two basic laws, life would be a lot simpler in this country. We would not have uh, thousand-page rule books that we have to understand. We would not have regulators swarming over everybody's business in this country, and ignorance of the law would be impossible because everybody would know what those two laws are. You would not have drug laws because uh, people are not intruding on other people's person or property by taking drugs. You would not have gun laws because people are not intruding on other people's person or property by owning guns, but you should be prosecuted whenever you do intrude on somebody else's person or property, whether or not you have a gun, whether or not you're high on drugs, whether or not you have hate in your heart or liquor on your breath. Uh, Richard, thanks so much for calling. I always enjoy hearing from you because you bring another perspective to this. And we will be back in just a minute, and we'll continue with some interesting phone calls. This is Harry Brown. You can join me at 1-800-510-TALK. Let's continue talking with people on the telephone. Right now we're going to talk with Ben in New Orleans. Good evening, Ben. Hi, how are you doing? Just fine. What's up? Um, you were talking earlier about you were going through a long list of what the Lusitania, um, the Maine, mm-hmm. Gulf of Tonkin, Pearl uh-huh. Harbor. The, all those incidents, um, they make me want to study more 9-11, to try and figure out what happened. Um, I have been studying 9-11. Here's a couple things that I think should be looked at. Um, Seven World Trade Center, the skyscraper that was across the street, uh, collapsed uh, all of a sudden in the late afternoon. Um, That's kind of mysterious. Uh, NORAD, NORAD was nowhere to be found. That's the, what is it? The North American, it's a... it's, it's our defense system. Uh, it's supposed to be uh, like defense. like a giant radar to to notify. Yeah, they have a billion they have billion dollar budget, and uh, they said that they weren't able to do anything because 
they couldn't get any information from the FAA. Um, well, that's a surprise. <laughs> if there was a Soviet, if there was a Soviet MiG that was flying into the United States, would they have to ask the FAA where it was? Yeah. Um, there's the issue. Not, not anymore. Now we have the Department of Homeland Security, so all we have right. to do is run down the hall and get the answer. There's the, the hijackers training on military bases. Um, head of head of ISI, head of the Pakistani intelligence, wired Mohammed Atta, a hundred thousand dollars. He's in Washington D.C. having breakfast with Senators Graham and Goss on 9/11. Who who was having breakfast? Uh, General General Ahmed. Oh, from Pakistan. He's the, he was the former head of the ISI, mm-hmm. and in, the, the Indian papers um, came up with conclusive evidence that he had wired or ordered wired hundred thousand dollars to Atta. Um, now understand, I'm not making any accusations or, or trying to spread any kind of weird, wild conspiracy theories. I'm just saying that I think it would be prudent um, that everyone takes a close look at this. And it just seems like this country just kind of experienced 9/11, and it just seems like everyone just kind of turned away and moved on. And I think that we, I think that we need to take a look at what happened. Sure, and it probably will be several years before we'll really know what happened. And when I say really know what happened, it's not that I, in the back of my mind, am sure I know what happened and the truth will come out. I really don't know what happened. Not do but, I. but what usually is the pattern in all of these cases is that when the war ends. People are so relieved that they really don't care anymore. They tried to hold hearings in Congress during the Second World War about Pearl Harbor, after the Second World War about Pearl Harbor, and they couldn't get much traction because people just simply did not want to worry about it anymore. And, in fact, it was, what would have been, about like 50 years after Pearl Harbor that Congress finally exonerated the commanders at Pearl Harbor and said it wasn't their fault at all. But they had been the scapegoats at the time of Pearl Harbor, and they lost command, and I think uh, were pretty much drummed out of the service. That that was, uh, what was it, General Theobald and uh, Admiral Kimmel, I believe, were the two, or Admiral Short. In any event, the point is that it is hard to get people to care once the war is over. Now, in this case, we've been promised by our president that this war is going to go on for the rest of our lives. So people are still going to care, but when do the investigations really come? Well, there uh, is supposedly a 9-11 commission now. And God only knows what they're going to come up with. They'll probably say it's the CIA's fault again. Well, you notice they were looking. They wanted to look at the PBDs, the Presidential Daily Briefs. Mm-hmm. And, and the uh, president doesn't want them to see them. Right, but I, I don't see how that would really be relevant. Um, I think that's kind of misdirection. But there was an interesting quote by one of the commissioners who said, "We need to see these PBDs if this commission is going to quote pass the laugh test." <laughs> and I'm wondering, is that your goal? That's that's a good point. Is that your goal? <laughs> he may have meant that they had a very low bar to clear, but he also may have meant that very seriously and conscientiously, that if we can't even see what the president knew, then we're going to be laughed out of Washington, D.C. So at the very least, we ought to be able to see everything that the president saw. But again, I'm guessing at what the meaning of his words were. Well, I think it's going to be a long time before we can say with any authority what really happened on 9-11. In the meantime, we know what our government has done in response to 9-11, and it seems, in my view, to do the opposite of what would be prudent, what would be secure for the American people, and what would prevent a future attack of this kind. As I said earlier, nothing changed on 9-11. Our government is doing the same things that it did before 9-11 that provoked the attacks, and 9-11 was not something new. Our, uh, we have been attacked before by terrorists, and so the idea that this is a different world now, that everything has changed, that it justifies attacking countries that haven't attacked us and so forth is just simply bogus. Thanks so much for calling, Ben. I appreciate your insights, and let me know when you find out what happened on 9-11. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. You can join me at 1-800-510-TALK. Let us now go to Vermont and talk with Skeeter. Good evening, Skeeter. Good evening, uh, Harry, or I should say good morning. It's now 1234 in the morning here in East. Uh, I wanted to talk to you regarding uh, what I consider to be uh, what's likely to be a constitutional crisis since you mentioned in passing during an earlier phone conversation about the Constitution saying what the government can and cannot do. Mm-hmm. And I'm referring specifically to uh, Senator Bill Frist's announcement earlier this week that of his intent to push work in the Senate for passage of an amendment, a constitutional amendment to ban same-sex marriage. Uh-huh. Um, I've got a serious problem with it, not, not just because of the issue of discrimination. Uh, as I see it, the um, proposed amendment seeks to sanctify a secular institution, as well as to enforce by law uh, an exclusionary religious doctrine on gay and lesbian Americans. Both of those, in my opinion, violate the First Amendment's explicit prohibition on Congress making any law respecting an establishment of religion. Well, if you amend the Constitution, then what you have amended becomes part of the Constitution, so you can't say it's unconstitutional. But there only... is one problem with that. When it comes to the separation of church and state, the founding fathers inserted the supremacy clause yes, in the Constitution. But they and also, the Constitution they... itself but they also the law of land. But then they also inserted a clause that said this is the way you can amend the Constitution if you want to change any part of it. Now, my point that I want to make is only once 
in the history of the, the country has an amendment been passed that restricts the activities of the individuals in the country rather than restricting the activities of government. And that was the Prohibition Amendment that was passed in 1919. And, and, it, and it was a horrible mistake. Yes, it gave, and, among other things, it gave rise to organized crime. Of course, and the Defense of Marriage Amendment, so-called, isn't defending marriage at all because marriage is not under attack by anybody. But, here's the pre- uh, here's but, the re- but anyway, the point I want to make is that this would restrict what individuals can do. It may frame the language in the form of governments may not do this or do that, but in effect what they're saying is that governments may not make same-sex marriage legal, and in that way they are restricting the rights of individuals, and even though it would be constitutional, it would be contrary to the whole concept of a constitution, and it would be one more nail in the coffin but it is based on a false government. premise, that premise being that the, that the institution of civil marriage and the religious sacrament of holy matrimony are one and the same. They right. are not. No, in point of not. fact, civil marriage came about in the early 19th century as a direct response to what at that time was widespread sectarian prohibitions against the, uh, religious, insti- uh, religious institutions granting the sacrament of holy marriage, matrimony to couples because one spouse was of one faith and the other spouse was of another faith. So th- th- there is a very clear uh, difference between ma- matrimony and marriage. What, they are not one and the same. They are separate. And for the Congress to sanctify, because after all, what was the whole purpose, what was the argument of, the, of, the fa- of those in favor? To protect the sanctity of marriage. That word sanctity is religious. It's loaded with religion. There is no denial, there can be no denying that the purpose of trying to ban same-sex marriage is grounded in religion. And there, and I, I will argue until I'm blue in the face that if they go ahead and pass this amendment, they will violate the separation of church and state. Well, I can't disagree with you on any of that, but you're overlooking the good part of it. If they start defining what a marriage is, then this will lead to a lot of other good things. The next thing they'll do is they'll define what love is, and then they'll define exactly how you should raise your children. Oh, I'm sorry, they're already doing that. I forgot about that. They've been doing that for years. But, yes. uh, but, the, but the, alar- the, the alarm that I have is that this amendment represents an opening for a series of actions that could ultimately lead to this country becoming a theocratic dictatorship. This country would cease to be a democracy. It would become a theocratic dictatorship. Well, I understand what you're saying, and I agree with you that it is a very, very, very bad idea. It's, bad. it's not bad. It's dangerous. We, it has we, to be stopped. Actually, uh, you probably didn't hear the show last week, but a, a good part of the show was devoted to the subject. I said a few words about it at the beginning, and then a number of people called in a, about it uh, during the course of the show. The whole idea of defending marriage is just ridiculous because no matter who wants to get married, two women, two men, a man and his dog, whatever, that is not an attack on marriage. No, it is not. not. It is not going to interfere in any way with the relationship between you and your spouse, and the whole idea that marriage is under attack is just one more screaming Mimi, point with pride, view with alarm, political trick. And here is my prediction. I can't predict the future. Nobody can accurately and reliably. But here is my prediction. The amendment will not come to pass, but it represents the greatest fundraising tool that the conservatives have had since Hillary Clinton came into the White House in 1993. It will be a perennial favorite among the conservative groups to say, my God, we've got to protect marriage from this. Send us your money so that we can fight it in Washington, so that we can get this amendment through. Well, they've never gotten an amendment through uh, to outlaw abortion. They've never gotten... Well, that, would be the next, that would be the next step. Well, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if, there, if there's a fight on the House floor uh, amongst, the, amongst the anti-abortion sellouts to attach an anti-abortion writer to that amendment. Well, they may very well try to, but I can I can almost guarantee you that this amendment is not going to become part of the Constitution. Well, not in the current Congress, not given the current political makeup of the Congress. Well, e- e- even, no, even if the Congress were to propose it, it would not be ratified by a sufficient number of states. 38 it's, states have already passed the Defense of Marriage Act on their own. Don't tell me, and it, and it takes 37 states to ratify uh, a constitutional amendment, so it's already there. Well, I'm still convinced it will not happen, but it will be an issue for many years to come, and it will be a way of rallying the troops. It will be a way, for example, of getting people who uh, conservatives who are disgusted with George Bush to go to the polls in November and vote for George Bush because he's the only one standing up for marriage supposedly, and if we let John Kerry or Howard Dean or somebody else get into the White House the next thing you know, homosexuals would be getting married in this country, and you don't want that, do you? You better get out and vote for George Bush as much as you dislike him. No, it's it's going to be a tool for the conservatives, but I really don't think it's going to happen and I hope I'm right, uh, because I certainly don't want it to happen. Well, I don't, I'm not good at predicting either, but I, I have a feeling that it's going to, on the contrary, that it's going to drive a wedge between the conservatives. That's going to drive a, a split between the quote-unquote a uh, Wall Street conservatives against the Bible Belt conservatives. Well, I hope you're right. Thanks so much for calling, Skeeter. Thank it's the first time we've heard from you. And I, I happen to be a board operator at the Radio America's affiliate in uh, St. Albans, Vermont. Good. Are you carrying the show right now? I'm, yes. In fact, I'm, in fact, I'm going home as soon as you sign off. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not signing off then. <laughs> okay. Thanks again. All right. Thank you. With the time we have left, uh, I have a number of emails. I'll take uh, those emails, so I would suggest you don't call because we won't get to it. Uh, we've got calls about the wars and the quiz at the beginning and... 
about various other things on the war. David writes and says, Murray Rothbard's answer, in effect to my quiz, appeared in his article, America's Two Just Wars, 1775 and 1861, found in John V. Denson's uh, book, The Costs of War. Yes, I've read that. And, of course, in 1861, he said that that was a just war, but he was talking about the war for Southern independence, not Lincoln's side of the war. And that doesn't really answer the question there, uh, because I didn't really ask what were the just wars. I have never really taken a position on whether... This, that that was a just war, and I haven't tried to define just war. What I do believe is that war is almost never necessary, that there are ways of getting around that, and we talked about that uh, two or three weeks ago on this show. Danny writes and says, I agree with your position on the war and most other issues. I think that many other people would agree as well, but the libertarian message is just not out there. No small government conservative could possibly be happy with Bush's record right now, and it seems like this is a perfect opportunity for the Libertarian Party to capture some votes if only we could get some publicity. What can the Libertarians do to better get our message out? Do you think that having a candidate like Aaron Russo, who has some level of notoriety, would get more publicity for the party than the not-so-well-known Gary Nolan? And Danny here is referring to two gentlemen who are both seeking the Libertarian Party's nomination for president. He goes on to say, what is the best way for people like me to contribute? Would it be better for me to donate to an organization like the American Liberty Foundation or directly to the LP and to the candidates? Well, neither Aaron Russo or Gary Nolan is in a position to get the kind of publicity that we would like. What we need is a much bigger Libertarian Party. And during the last half of the 1990s, everything in the party was directed in, in that way towards getting a bigger membership that would have more clout, that could do more advertising, that could do more of everything. And the party's membership more than tripled during that period, but unfortunately it peaked in 2000 and has been dropping since then. According to the current chairman, they are getting close to the point where other problems have been solved and they intend to go back and start pushing membership again. We will just have to see what happens and we'll have to see who will be the new chairman of the party after the convention Memorial Day weekend this year. As to the question, what is the best way for people to contribute, would it be better to donate to the American Liberty Foundation or directly to the LP and to the candidates? Well, I'd like to see you contribute to all of those. I think that it's important that you contribute to the ones that make the most sense to you, that you can get the most enthusiastic about. If you don't, uh, don't contribute to one because that one's blocked out, it doesn't mean you'll contribute to another. People will do what they want to do, and the Libertarian Party and the Libertarian movement as a whole are based on the idea that people should do what they want to do because that's what they'll do efficiently and that's what they'll do enthusiastically, just as we don't want to see government dictating what people do. Uh, Jonathan in Washington, D.C. says, first, just for future reference, the current California budget is about $100 billion a year. I thought it was about $100 billion, but not too long ago, I saw some reference in the newspaper to about $80 billion a year. Whatever it is, it is close to 100 times as big as the budget was when they had part-time legislators there. Second, uh, Jonathan says, I've called into your show before to complain that Neil Bortz is scheduled to speak at the 2004 Libertarian National Convention. Now Carl Pope, the executive director of the Sierra Club, has been scheduled to speak as well. The Sierra Club, of course, is a large environmental organization that supports all kinds of government regulations. I'm starting to wonder what the heck is going on with the LNC. Well, according to Jeffrey Neal, the chairman of the party, Neil Bortz is going to speak on eminent domain, and that's his subject, and he'll be limited to that, is supposed to be limited to that subject. Carl Pope has some free market ideas about environmentalism, and he's supposedly going to talk on where libertarians and environmentalists agree. Now, what will actually happen in practice, I can't promise, but that's the way it's supposed to be. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes, and we still have one more segment to go. This is Harry Brown. Welcome back. Harry Brown here. I'll continue with some emails that I've received tonight. Christopher listens to the show on the Internet from England. And he says, I have a query regarding your book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. Within the recorded interviews on your website, you state that people should be free to determine their own morality. What exactly do you mean by this? I'm not an expert in moral philosophy, but wouldn't such principle lead to a more chaotic society? Well, first of all, Christopher, people do determine their own morality. They may decide to adopt a morality they find in the Bible or that they got from Ayn Rand or that they got from some other source, but each person makes his own determination. The problem is that people don't believe, in many cases, that they're making their own determination. They believe they are adopting the only morality possible. This is a very interesting subject, which I really can't do justice to in a 30-second or 60-second answer. So I'm going to consider making this the topic of the opening segment, perhaps next week or the week after. And I'll go into this in more detail, because it has a strong bearing on many things that we talk about on this show. Christopher also asks if I have read the book, What It Means to Be a Libertarian, by Charles Murray. If so, what is your opinion in relation to Mr. Murray's plan for a minimum state? I have read the book. I think it's a very good book. I like Charles Murray. I think he's a very fine fellow. I would go a lot further than Charles Murray does. My book, The Great Libertarian Offer, or Why Government Doesn't Work, is much, much more 
in favor of dramatic reductions in government. But Charles Murray had a lot of interesting ideas in that book, and it's well worth reading. Bob writes to say, what do you suppose the founders thought about the concept of separation of church and state? Does the Libertarian Party believe that state and local governments should be free to set their own religious agendas and level of integration with government? That is, do you believe that state and local governments should be allowed to set their own religious agendas and that those that live there should be subjected to the will of the majority? If And then if you don't like it, then leave. I would much prefer that. I would much prefer that state and local governments overstep their bounds than to give the federal government the power to impose upon all state and local governments, whatever it is that the people who have gained control of the federal government want. We have lost that federalism in America, and as a result, almost everything now is fair game for laws from Washington. Eric writes, during the the 90s, this is in reference to the question about the prosperity of the 90s, Eric says, during the 90s, most people thought they were getting very rich, but in fact, they were eating their seed corn. And while the boom was going on, we were spending profits that we thought we were making, but later found were only paper profits. Only after the bust did we realize how we had been fooled during the boom. He goes on a question about history. I often debate friends about history, and it always returns the same issue. How do any of us know what written histories were fake versus real? All we can do today is a literature search. Nobody is around from hundreds of years ago, and how do we even know that documents that have survived are real? After all, about half of everything I read in the papers today seems false, so how can we ever be sure of any of our facts? I ask this question since you are now writing a book about the history of wars, but you only have direct experience since World War II. Well, first of all, there is not as much dispute about the facts of history as you might think. Historians agree with uh, that Roosevelt maneuvered the United States into World War II. What historians disagree about was whether it was the right thing to do. There are some facts, so-called, of history that are in, di- in dispute, but most of the facts are pretty well settled, and it is r- rather an argument over whether what the politicians did about those facts was the right thing to do. Where the facts are in dispute, you pretty much have to go with whatever you think is consistent with you. what you know is the way the world works. If somebody writes a history in which he says that businessmen abused their customers, abused their employees, and made huge profits doing so, that doesn't jibe with what you know about the way the world works. You can't make money abusing your customers because somebody else is going to come along and offer them relief from that and take all the business away from you. So you tend to discount somebody who says this is the way that history was. And a last question. There isn't anything on the radio during the day besides conservative talk. I'm picking up a station here in Huntsville, Alabama, but these folks and their listeners are extreme conservatives. What is it about the airwaves that carry only conservative views? I believe there's a majority who wants to hear the libertarian message and hasn't been exposed to it. What are your plans? My plans are to do the best I can. I hope you will do the best you can, too. My apologies to the other emails I didn't get to. Please come back and listen next week. This is Harry Brown. Have a good week. Good night. <laughs>